Praise the Lord. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome, welcome to another program of Living by the Word. And of course, on this program, we encourage you to apply the principles of the Word of God to your everyday life. Today, I just want to greet you in the matchless name of the King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world. His name is Jesus. Amen. And we just bless God for all of you who take time to tune in week after week week to living by the word and I trust that it is truly causing fruit to be brought forth in your life for the honor and glory of our God. Before we get into the program today, we want to take time to invite you to a very special event that's coming up. It's happening every year and this year is no different. Right now on May the 7th at 12 noon, we are going to kick off Jesus Rally 2016 Saturday, May 7th. Of course, at 12 noon, we're going to kick off Jesus Rally. Jesus Rally happens every year. Of course, it's an awesome motorcade that goes through the island of Tobago, stopping at various points to pray for our nation. And this year is no different. We meet at the Dwight York Stadium for 12 noon. Yes, the time is a little bit different. 12 noon, we are going on a shorter route. And of course, we are going to leave from the Dwight York Stadium and the motorcade will end on the Esplanade. For more information, you could contact Sister Shelley at 299-6903. I'm going to give you that number again, 299-6903. Jesus Rally is here again on May 7, 12 noon at the Dwight York Stadium. So see and be there. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us get into the word of God for today. Father, we thank you for your word. And we declare, Father, as your word goes forth, it shall penetrate even to the deep and dark recesses of the heart. Father, you said your word is quick and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of joints and marrow. And Father, it is a discerner of the intents of the hearts of man. Father, do what you want to do as your word goes forth to the hearts of your people today, for your honor and your glory, in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. We want to continue talking today about the topic, who is a Christian? And I want us to be able at the end of this study to answer for ourselves who a Christian is. I'm just going to recap from last uh, message where we are saying that if you uh, do a survey of persons around the world, a large number of persons would say that they are Christians. A large number of persons around the world would say, yes, this is a Christian nation. I am a Christian. Amen. And of course, the research that when I looked at North America, I said up to 85% of people believe that. Now look at all the things that's happening in the news and the world around us. If 85% of the people really say that they are Christians, something must be wrong with our world or with that definition. Amen. There are those who say, well, a Christian is somebody who is born again. And when we look at the American, North American um, context, it said up to 35% of North Americans are born again. Now that is a significant number. Amen. If you're talking about what's happening worldwide to say we are born again, only 35%. But of course, we want to see God touch the hearts of people so that number can continue to increase as the gospel goes forth. And of course, there are those who say that a Christian is the persons in my denomination alone. Amen. Only those persons who believe exactly what we believe are Christians. And I said last time that that last, I mean, I have to put in a plug right there for that particular definition because the word of God even says in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9 that Jesus was found worthy to open the scroll because by his very blood, he he's able to save and deliver people from every nation, from every tribe, come on, from every region. <laughs> And I'm saying to us, if that is the case, then it cannot just be the few people who believe what we believe, think what we think, act like we act, dress like we dress, pause when we pause, and just do what we do in our little circle of influence. Come on, the grace of God is extending to all men because God wants all men to be saved from every nation under the earth, places that our um, ministry, as it were, or our denomination, and may never be able to touch the gospel messages going into those areas. You know, I was looking at even 
um, TBN and those programs, and they are reaching nations across the globe. So God is in the saving business because he wants men to be saved. Amen. And of course, we went into some other things. Is, it, is a Christian somebody who is just a moral person? Is a Christian somebody who, because you're born in Trinidad and Tobago, and we say that God is a Trini, then that makes me a Christian. Is a Christian somebody who just says, well, I believe in God. Amen. There are many religions who believe in God. But that does not necessarily make them a Christian. Amen. In fact, James 2 and 19 says, you believe there is one God. Good. Even demons believe that and they shudder. So believing that there's one God doesn't, doesn't itemize, doesn't separate, doesn't signify in any big way that we are Christians. Let's go ahead. Growing up in a Christian home, does that make me a Christian automatically? <laughs> Amen. Can you answer that? There are many persons who grew up in Christian homes. And I said last time, even Ted Bundy, who was a serial murderer, he said he grew up in a Christian home. So growing up in a Christian home, does that automatically make me a Christian? Amen. Church membership. I have church membership. I'm a member of such and such church. I go there faithfully every week. I serve. I usher. I sing in the choir. Does my church membership in the local church automatically make me a Christian? We need to answer that. And another um, excuse or another reasons or definition that some people give, because I baptize. Amen. Does that make me a Christian? We want to answer from the word of God. It's not to belittle. It's not to, to pull down. But I think these are the days when we need to make our calling an election show. And I'm saying to us, if we have misinformation, then we would live a life that is not true to what God wants us to, to benefit from. We're going to mess it up now, hallelujah, and we're going to mess it up later because we would not be able to benefit after this life. If we get this thing wrong right now, amen, when you talk to people, a number of people are comfortable to say, yes, I'm a Christian. But what does it really mean? Are you living the life? Are you benefiting from what Christianity is supposed to benefit? Come on, since you've become a Christian, what has changed? You know, one person says, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us. There are some people, only Christians on the weekend. Amen. Is that what Christianity is about? You know, no wonder sometimes people look at the church, local church I'm saying now, and they are confused and they make these comments and say, well, hey, if this person is a Christian, how come they're doing this? How come they're doing that? Yes. And it doesn't mean that they're looking all are right. But do you know what you're supposed to be doing if you profess to be a Christian? Let me get into the word of God. And let me say to us from the word of God that Jesus himself never used the words Christian. <laughs> Jesus himself never used the word Christian. In fact, the word Christian is used only three times in the Bible. Amen. It's used by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, when he says, however, if you suffer as a Christian, he says, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Amen. Peter uses it to look at the extent of the suffering. And I'm saying to us one time, there's a, there's a part of Christianity, yes, that is identified with suffering. And Peter notes that because sometimes we give people the impression that when we come to the Lord and we become a Christian, then everything will be honky-dory. It's going to be a bed of roses. Can I tell you, even a bed of roses has thorns. Suffering is not something strange to being called a Christian. When Peter uses it, Peter says it's not strange to suffer as a Christian because we identify with Christ himself, the one whom we follow in his suffering. The other time the word is used in the book of Acts, Acts 26, 28 to 29, when Paul found himself before um, King Agrippa and he shared his testimony of what God did in his life. And King Agrippa says, hey, you almost persuaded me 
to become a Christian in such a short time. And Paul says to him, short time or long time, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Paul knew exactly what he was. Whatever King Agrippa wanted to call him, Paul says, I know what I am. And whether it's in a short time or a long time, please. He said, I wish that every single person could be like me, except for the chains that they had put on him for proclaiming the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. King, The king heard him. The king said, you almost persuade me. Paul says, come on, I wish everybody was a Christian like me. I wish everybody believed what I believe. And this is part of what we are saying to you today. We wish that everybody would understand what it means to be a servant of the Most High God. What it means to be in covenantal relationship. What it means for God to come in your situation like he did Paul, hallelujah, and turn your life around so that you would be steadfast, unmovable, abounding, focused, pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That is what Paul is saying. I wish everybody had the zeal for God. I wish everybody would throw away their own way of doing things, their own philosophy, their own lifestyle, and become as how I am, sold out for Jesus. Jesus. Paul says, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which has been committed unto him against that day. In another part, Paul says that he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I, but it's Christ living in me. It is Christ living in me. He says the life I now live in the flesh. I live it by the faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the Paul that is talking, who used to persecute Christians, who was there when Stephen was martyred, and he would go on, on would get the permission to take Christians and to kill them and to throw them in prison. And Paul was changed by Jesus. He understood that though he was zealous for the law, a Pharisee of Pharisees, Come on, going about doing what he thought was right. When he met Jesus, his life did a 180. He was struck with blindness. Come on, he was baptized and he then took the same zeal that he was persecuting and preaching against the way of Christ. And now he was sold out a hundred percent. He did not even regard his life. There was one time they said, Brother Paul, the Spirit of God is saying, if you go up to that city, they are going to put you in chains and put you in bounds. Paul says, I am still going. He was so loud for Jesus. I'm saying to us, if we profess to be Christians, are we so loud for Jesus? Amen. Are we like Paul? <laughs> Amen, as he's saying, you know, when these, these men started the work of, of the church, it was not what we see today. And I, I, I'm sorry, this, this very comfortable way of doing things, we thank God for technology that has made it comfortable for us to enjoy the four walls and to sit and to sing and to shout and to dance and get all dressed up. But it was not like that for them. When you look at the word of God, you will see that the early Christians were heavily persecuted, but that did not stop them. They were beaten. They were imprisoned. On. They were flogged. Remember Paul and Silas? They were in a they were in a Philippian jail cell with stocks on their feet. Come on, James was martyred by Herod. He was killed, and Peter in Acts chapter twelve, he was about to be be, be be put to death as well. Because when Herod saw that taking James pleased the people, he said, "Aha! Uh -huh, I get him now. I'm gonna take Peter." 
That is the legacy that we enjoy today. That we sit down sometimes and say, I, I feel to go to church now. Nah. I can't take this long preaching now. Nah. Blood of the saints, blood of Christians. Come on, somebody was shed for what we enjoy today called Christianity. It was not an easy thing. In fact, the third time that word Christian is used is Acts chapter 11, 26. And that's why I want to um, um, stay and help us understand. In Acts eleven twenty six, 26, it says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Many believe that this is a name that they looked at with scorn. They saw how they behaved in such a manner that it represented and it reflected Christ. Remember who they took down the Via Dolorosa. Come on, down the streets of Jerusalem. And they killed him by crucifixion on a cross between two thieves. That was the legacy of the Christ that they now declared had resurrected. And the people were looking at them. They said these men turned the whole world upside down. Men who were running and scampering had denied Jesus. Now the Holy Ghost had come upon them and they were fired up. And they were going, they were going, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. They were going to declare, repent, repent, he says, change your mind, save yourself. Come on, turn your hearts to God and bring forth fruit that we could see that you have really made a change. That is what these men were doing. Amen. So back in the day when they were called Christians, it was not necessarily something to celebrate and say, aha, look at me. I have a Sunday best. I have a weekend best. I just good as gold. Watch me. It was not that at all. They were coming up against the very Jews who rejected the Messiah. Come on. And was now teaching people resurrection of this Jesus, this carpenter's son. They were now teaching that he was the one that God would send. Jesus himself, when he walked the earth, he was criticized. His very own rejected him. So then when they came now to say, hey, well, also be behaving like Jesus. It was not something necessary to be celebrated. For the disciples, they celebrated the fact that they were worthy to suffer and to be affiliated with such a great teacher. But to the world, being called Christians was not something to, yeah boy, amen. And it says disciples were called Christians. And this is where I, I want to say to us, amen. People were called disciples. Yes, disciples were called Christians. Those who followed Jesus' teaching. Those who lined up their lives to what he said, what he taught. Those whose lives represented Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Those whose lives demonstrated the life of Christ as they lived. Amen. Those who lived their lives patterning after Jesus, they saw them and they said, hey, these are behaving like Christ. These are little Christ. These are Christians. Their lives were so lived that those who saw them, come on, could not deny, had to conclude that they were Christians. Can they say the same about us? Amen. Some of us, we are so concerned about the title of Christians and we are not disciples. Amen. Disciples are called Christians. And what is a disciple? Amen. The, the many definitions of disciple. And, and the, the Greek word matete says a disciple is a learner. is a pupil. A disciple is a student. A disciple is somebody who is devoted to follow a great religious leader or teacher of philosophy. A disciple is somebody devoted to follow a great religious leader or teacher. The disciple is a follower of Christ 
example Christ disciple who learns the doctrines of scripture and the lifestyle that they are required to live. Let me say that again. A disciple of Christ is therefore one who learns the doctrine of scripture and the lifestyle they are required to live. A disciple is one who imitates his teacher. A disciple is one who not only accepts the views of the teacher, but that he is also in practice an adherent. So what he's saying is not just that, yeah boy, Jesus taught some good things, boy. Yeah, them things are else some good. But no, he also practices those things. A disciple is one who accepts the teaching of another, not only in belief, but in life. Therefore, by this definition, if my life does not reflect the teachings of Jesus, then it goes to say I am not a disciple. <laughs> I have not been discipled in the teachings of Jesus. So I cannot now say, well, I am, I am like Jesus. I don't know what he has taught. I don't know what he has said. I don't know how he lived. I don't know him. Hey, that's why Jesus said in, the, in that day, people will come and they will say, we cast all demons in your name. We prophesy in your name. We did it in your name. But Jesus said, you're not my follower. <laughs> your life does not line up. A disciple is one who imitates the example of his teacher. I said that already. It's one who gives full loyalty and support to another. I give you full loyalty. I support 100%. A disciple is one with devoted allegiance to the teachings of the one chosen as his master. Let me say that again. A disciple is a devoted allegiance to the teachings of one chosen as master. Is Jesus your master? Is Jesus your Lord? Jesus said in one place, he said, many come to me and they call me Lord, but they don't do what I tell them to do. A disciple is one who is devoted to the teachings of one chosen as a master. When we say Jesus is master and Lord, we are saying that we give up all rights to ownership of even self. And he ultimately is in control. Is Jesus in control of our lives? We hear many people saying, well, it's my business. I could do what I want. It's my body. Leave me, let me live my life. How I want to live my life. Is Jesus your master and Lord? Then we have no ownership to anything. He owns it all. He says, you can't say I'm your Lord and you don't do what I tell you to do. That must not be your portion. It's one who accepts and helps to spread the teachings of another. One who takes up the ways of another. Hallelujah. He accepts and helps to spread the teaching. Is our Christianity a personal thing? People telling you that. Your morality is a personal thing. Keep those things to yourself. I don't want to hear you. That's not what Jesus tells us. It says it is one who accepts and helps to spread the teachings of another. Amen. One who takes up the ways of another. So I accept the teaching and by my talk and my walk, I am spreading that message all over. I'm saying to us, many of us are disciples of other things even around us and other people. Because sometimes our conversation is more about what the world is doing and what a celebrity is doing and who we're trying to keep up with and what this person has said. And it's not about spreading the message of Jesus. It's an adherent, one who adheres to or supports a system or set of principles. That is a disciple. I am adhering to it. I am following it. I am looking at it. When you see my life, you don't have any questions who my master is. Is that your testimony? Hallelujah. Is that our testimony today? Come on. The Pharisees, they, they, they prided themselves. 
of being disciples, hallelujah, of Jesus, of, of, of Moses, that they pride themselves, hallelujah. In John chapter 9, 28 to 29, they prided themselves of being disciples of Moses. John had disciples. If I can Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Jesus' disciples went to him and said, Listen, teach us to pray as how John taught his disciples to pray. John disciples were taught of him. John disciples followed him. John disciples did what, what John did. They prayed how John taught them to pray. And now Jesus' disciples, those who seek to follow, says, we also want to be taught by you so we can pray how you need us to pray. Amen. So a disciple is one who learns from his master, from his teachers. He learns and he imitates the life of the teacher. He inculcates those values and he reproduces the teaching. Let me go again. A disciple is one who therefore he learns from his teacher. He imitates the teacher's life. He inculcates his values. What does Jesus say about this? What does Jesus say about that? And that is what I'm also going to do. What he says about, about giving. What he says about forgiveness. What he says. Amen. And that is what I inculcate in my life. And I also reproduce this. When they these people saw in Antioch how well these unlearned men, hallelujah, these unlearned men were behaving, were operating and manifesting certain qualities. They had no choice but to say, these are Jesus, these are Jesus people. These are Christ ones. These ones are just like Christ. And I'm saying to us, this is why the world looking at us and have a real problem surrendering their lives to the Christ we preach. Because oftentimes our walk does not match our talk. And though we say Christ and we say Christian, our lives do not exemplify, don't reflect, don't emanate the teaching, the life, the values, the principles of Christ that we profess. Of course, this is all the time we have. We want to thank you for staying tuned to Living by the Word. We encourage you to apply the principles of the Word of God to your everyday life. And we're going to continue talking about who is a Christian. God bless you. Bye-bye for now. Amen.